So last time we were asking this question of when is a knot knotted. So this is a, a knot which is not knotted. And we can make a knotted knot by tying it into a, a knot. And then we get this guy, which you remember is called the, the trefoil. That's right. And so the question is, how do we know for certain that we can't unknot the trefoil to get the unknot without breaking it open? Because like the unknot, you know, like you, you can make it look all weird and twisted and okay, maybe not. I don't know. It kind of looks like it's knotted up, but then you can be clever and get it unknotted. So how do we know there's not a clever way to do some series of moves to unknot the trefoil? So that was the big question we had last time of when is it not knotted? So let's just do a recap. So um, we had that, uh, uh, we said that two knots are equivalent, which our fancy word for that was ambient isotopic, which is saying there's this nice isotopy between the ambient spaces, but, but it just means that one can be deformed into the other one without passing through itself. The ambient and isotopic, we said this is true if and only if what? That's right. We can move from one to the other. Um, so we can say they are related. We can move from a diagram for one to a diagram to another via our Reidemeister moves. Reidemeister moves. And so the three Reidemeister moves were, what was the first one? Twist, that's right, you, you have a strand and you put a, a twist into it. What was the second one? That's right, a poke. So you have two strands and you poke one over the other or vice versa, the other over this one. And what was the third one? That's right, the slide where if you have some crossing and you have something else going on in the background, this component's underneath them, then you can slide it under, keeping it under the whole time. So that now he ends up being on top of the Reidemeister move. Now, one direction is obvious. If you're related by these Reidemeister moves, then you're equivalent. You can just move from one to the other via these Reidemeister moves. This direction is much less obvious, that these are the only three moves you need. And so this destruction is actually a pretty powerful result. But then from here, we introduce some idea of colorability. So what did it mean for not to be colorable? What are two criteria? Can you use at least two labels? Yeah, so you use at least two colors. Use greater than or equal to two colors. And what else? Yeah, so at each crossing, well, you never have just two that are the same. Either they're all the same color, all same color, or all different. It's kind of like the game set, if you've played the game set before. And so as an example, if you have the uh, trefoil. This is colorable because you can take three colors, red, blue, yellow, and color this arc one color, color this arc a different color, and color this arc a third color. So this is colorable. But if you take something like the figure eight knot, it fails to be colorable. So uh, figure eight knot looks something like, like this. And we went through and we convinced ourselves there's no way to color this. I mean, you can try it. You can color it like red. And then it's like, well, you can color this either the same or different. If you try and color it the same, it would be red. This one would be red, it ends up all red. That's bad, it violates the first condition. So try and color it something different like yellow 
Well, this is red and yellow, so they must be all different there. So this must be blue. This is red and blue, so this must be yellow. Ah, but then you get a contradiction. Two are yellow, one's red. Gives you a, a contradiction. So this is not colorable. And so this now becomes a way to distinguish knots, those which are colorable. Oh, also the unknot is not colorable. If you draw in color, you see one color. You know, that's bad. Not colorable. And so we can tell that these knots are distinguished from these other knots. It gives us two buckets. And then we come and we say, well, let's generalize this idea. Instead of just being, this was the idea of being tricolorable, we generalize it to being p-colorable. And so we are coloring using two colors from the colors 0, 1, 2, up through p minus 1. And our, this second condition became some condition at, at each crossing, where you have x and y crossing under z. We had x plus y must be equivalent to 2z mod p. Is this all familiar? Great. And then the last thing we did, the really cool thing we did, is we said, OK, how can we tell if something is p-colorable or not? Well, it's kind of hard to figure this out. We introduced the determinant. That's right. So how do we introduce the determinant? Well, from this kind of uh, labeling, which is equivalent to the labeling, um, let's say, 2z minus x minus y is equivalent to 0 mod p, um, this suggested that we should label, uh, create a matrix corresponding to at, at z, it's labeled with a 2, at y and x, negative 1s, and this came to solving the system of equations. And so then we got this, we got some matrix, so given some not k, we got some matrix, we deleted a row column of it, but then we took the determinant of that matrix, and we said that the knot is p-colorable, if and only if, so this was our big result. This was our big, we'll call it a theorem. We say k is p-colorable, tri-colorable, five-colorable, etc. if and only if p divides the determinant of the matrix associated to the knot. So maybe I'll say that's m sub k, the matrix associated to the knot. And sure enough, when we calculated this guy, I believe the determinant was 3 for the trifile, yeah. which is why it's 3 colorable, because 3 divides 3. But for the figure 8, it is 5. That's right. So 3 does not divide 5, so it's colorable. Although it is 5 colorable, you could do it 5 colorable. OK, so that was last time. Um, but there are some things I want to wrap up really fast. First of all, notice in this definition of determinant, what does it rely upon? In order for us to get to that determinant, what do we have to use? We need the yes, we needed a diagram. That's right. And so the question is, um, how do we know? How do we know that different diagrams for the same knot, but different diagrams? will give the same determinant. You see the problem? Right, like, like we found the determinant, I said for the trefoil, but it was for this depiction of the trefoil. There are other diagrams that depict the trefoil. So how do we know that the determinant is independent of our choice of diagram? Lots of different diagrams we could use. So how do we know they all give you the same determinant? How do we show that? You're pointing. What are we pointing at? I was wondering if it was right That's right. Right moves. Right? We just need to show, answer, just show the determinant is preserved under your itemized moves. Move one, move two, 
and move three. Because then if you have any two diagrams, you can move from one to the other via a series of Rademeister moves, right? And if we know at each step, the determinant stays the same, then we know overall the determinants can stay the same. Cool? So let's do it. Well, I, I'm not going to do it for all of them, but let's just, I don't know, let's pick one. Like, let's pick R1. And let's see why the determinant doesn't change under R1. So imagine we had some, some not. Okay, so here's some not. Oh, I'm going to introduce some notation. This is like K, and it's a not. This loop's been tied up into a knot. And then I've done a, an R1 move. So now I still have the knot somehow, but you know I've introduced a twist into it. I'll make that a little bit bigger. I've introduced a twist. Let's think how this impacts the matrices. Okay, so, so for K, we have some, some knot matrix. So this has some matrix associated to it. Um, and you know, you, you, when you get this matrix in the process, you have to label each of the arcs. I guess we should label this X. Maybe that's like the last arc. Oh, let me, let me show a little more detail of what's going on here. At some point, Xn is gonna cross over some other arc. And okay, and then there's some mysterious nodding going on there. So it's gonna cross over some other arc. I guess we can call that like arc xn minus one. And then it changes from xn to like xn minus two. Just labeling my arcs. Similarly over here, all of this part's gonna stay the same. All, all of this stays the same. So all of that will stay the same. At some point this will cross over some arc and It'll be knotted up in some way. So it's knotted up somehow. So let's say if this arc is still going to be Xn, but by putting this twist into it, I've introduced a new arc. There's one more arc than there was before. Before Xn went all the way, now Xn crosses under itself and you get uh, this new arc, which I'll call Xn plus one, which then crosses under this guy, which we called He's staying the same, xn minus one, and then he becomes this xn minus two, xn minus two. So let's think of how the matrices of these guys look. So this matrix right here, let's see, he has some matrix, and for a good bit of it, I have no idea how it looks, but I know at this crossing right here, maybe, maybe this will call this the, the nth crossing, so let's we'll say this is like the, the nth crossing. This is the, the nth crossing. So that's gonna be down here at n. Well, what am I gonna have for the nth row? How does the algorithm work? Yeah, the overstrand is n minus one. So in the nth minus one position, which is like, you know, let's say somewhere around Somewhere around here is like the nth minus one position. This is like the nth position. So in the, in the nth minus one position, it's gonna be two. And in both the nth and the nth minus two, it's gonna be minus one. And then it's zeros everywhere else. And for this last guy, xn, well, I guess we're not 100% sure. Uh, he can cross over some other things as well. So, you know, there could be some fancy stuff going on up here. We're not, we're not quite sure what all is going on up there. But this, this is the nth column. This is, this is the nth minus one. This right here is the xn, is the column representing xn. This is the column representing xn minus one, and so forth. So the matrix looks something like that. Now, what happens when we introduce this, uh, this little twist? Oh, pause. How do we then, how do we then calculate the determinant? No, no, don't pause that. Yeah, you delete some row and column and you just take the determinant of that thing, right? So like, let's call that thing something. What should we call it? Maybe, maybe M? I'll call it M. 
we take the determinant of that m, which is an n by 1 by n by 1 matrix. OK, so what happens over here? When we come over here, what's our matrix going to look like? First of all, how big of a matrix is it going to be? Yeah, we began with a n plus 1 by n plus 1 matrix. So we're going to come all the way down here to the nth plus 1 uh, row. And here's like the nth row. And maybe here's like the n minus 1 row. So we can delineate those. And we go all the way to the right to the xn plus 1 column and the xnth column. and the xn minus 1 column. And then, you know, a bunch of smaller ones. OK, notice matrix M stays the same, because we didn't fiddle with anything smaller than, smaller than your, um, yeah, we didn't fiddle with any of the uh, nth minus 1 crossings or anything like that. So this matrix M is staying the same, and that's going to be this guy. He all stays. Well, he almost stays the same. Actually, one thing changes. The only thing is, does anything change? No, I don't think anything changes. Yeah, because we, we didn't impact any of those crossings at all. OK, so that's the same. How about in the nth row? Well, now at crossing n, it's almost exactly the same as it was before, except here, xn has become xn plus 1. So this minus 1, which was in the nth row, is now going to be in the nth plus 1 row. So the minus 1 is going to be here, but you're still going to have the 2 and the minus 1. You're still going to have 2 and minus 1, and all zeros. And then we have this crossing, so I might as well give that crossing a name. Let's call this the, the nth plus 1 crossing. So that would be our last row. And how is that going to look? Well, you have xn on top. So that's going to get our 2. And then what do you have on bottom? xn plus 1 is on bottom. What else is on bottom? xn is also on bottom. So you also put the minus 1 there. So you get 2 minus 1 there, which becomes just positive 1. And everything else is zeros. OK. Oh, and, and the xn plus 1 is just this guy. He doesn't interact with any other strands. So these are all zeros. Tracking with me? OK. Now, to calculate the determinant of this guy, what do I need to do? Yeah, I can delete a row and column of my choosing. I'll delete this one. And notice what I get. I get the matrix I had before with a new row and column with a load negative 1 right there. But you tell me, what is the determinant? So this is just the matrix I had before, M, with then all zeros and a 1, a negative 1, and all zeros. But what's the determinant of this? Negative. Negative what? Negative. Yeah, it's just this determinant times negative 1. So what R1 does to your determinant is it multiplies it by negative 1. So we have here, so if this is some original diagram, I don't know. Um, uh, maybe this is some original diagram. Here, I'll call this like m prime. What we see is we see the, the determinant of m is a negative, the determinant of m prime. So OK, did it change the determinant? Kind of, it changed the sign of it. But all it did was change sign. And I, I tell you, and you should go test it out, you can do the same argument with r2 and r3, and see the determinant will only change by sign, nothing else. Like, at most change by sign. So then what we can do is we can define the determinant of a knot to be the determinant of m take its absolute value where m is matrix obtained 
from any diagram for M, for, for the not K. So no matter what diagram you begin with, you get the same determinant up to absolute value. So this is an example of a not invariant. What I mean by that is it stays invariant. As you change the diagram, as you take your knot and you, you move it around and you deform it, and you calculate it, and you deform it some more, and you calculate it again, no matter how you deform it, it's going to stay the same. Now this is the second, or possibly third, depending on how you count it, not invariant that we saw. What was the first one? The what? Oh, well, what's something that stays the same as you, as you transform? What's a property that stays the same? Colorability. Colorability, that's right. Colorability is like a binary inv invariant. It's either 0, 1, colorable or not. This is, a, is an integer-valued invariant. You know, it spits out some integer that describes that not. What I want us to do today, here we go. We've seen a binary invariant for a not. Is it colorable or not? 0 and 1. We've seen a, an integer invariant for the knot, determinant. I want us to develop a polynomial invariant for a knot. That is, any knot you pick spits out a polynomial. Now notice the integer invariant is more powerful than the binary. A binary it just separates you into two baskets, colorable or not colorable. This separates into infinitely many baskets, and the determinant told us if it was colorable or not. So it's a more powerful invariant. So imagine now we're going to move from integers to integral polynomials, polynomials of integer coefficients. And it's like, whoa, we're just going to a whole new universe. And so what I want to introduce to you today is something called the Alexander polynomial. And I'm super excited about this. So I've already set it up by telling you this definition of the determinant of how to calculate it, because the Alexander polynomial is going to be very similar. Here's going to be our rule. Well, first we need to begin by giving knots orientations. And all I mean by that is when you have a knot, you're going to come and give it some orientation. So you're going to be like, oh, hey, let's travel around this way. There we go. And you just give it some orientation. So from now on, we can give knots orientations. And here's how the Alexander polynomial works. Whenever you see a crossing that looks like this, this, this is called a right-handed crossing. So, so why is it a right-handed? Because if you take your right hand, maybe in physics you do this, right? You take your right hand, you put your thumb out in the direction of the top, the overcrossing. Which way do your fingers curl? And your fingers are curling with the bottom. So it agrees with your right hand. By way of contrast, if you looked at this kind of crossing, well now it would be going against my fingers on the bottom. It doesn't agree with my right hand. Instead it agrees with my left hand. So this is called a left-handed crossing. And we have ways of assigning a matrix to it. So here's how we're going to build the matrix. At the crossing, the overcrossing, we're going to give the value 1 minus t. At the tail of the undercrossing, it'll be minus 1. And at the head, where it comes out from the undercrossing, it'll be t. For the left-handed, on top, we'll give it 1 minus t. The tail now will give t. And the head coming out, we give minus 1. So they, they flipped. Here the tail is eight minus one. Here the tail of the undercrossing is t. And so let's see how this works. Let me uh, just go through the algorithm for an, exa an example, and you'll see how this works. So let me go ahead and build a, a figure eight knot. A little bit more exciting than the trefoil. So this is the, the figure eight. And so here's how we do it. First. We give it an orientation. You can go either direction. It doesn't matter. 
Notice like here, if I pick the opposite orientation, uh, here I could have given the opposite orientation. He would be the opposite. This guy would be going the opposite way. He would be going the opposite way. But notice it's still left-handed. It's, you know, it's not right-handed. It's still left-handed. And then you have to, you know, uh, name the pieces accordingly. Just emphasizing that the orientation doesn't determine left or right hand. It's the orientation you choose arbitrarily. So let's just pick an orientation. I'll go this way. Come down, come down, go over, up, up, down, over. How many crossings do we have? Yeah, there are four, so it's going to be a four by four matrix we're going to build. And then just like before, we're going to delete a row and delete a column. So here are my crossings. Let's label the arcs. So we can label them however you want. Let's just, you know, maybe call this guy x1. Call this guy coming down x2. Call this guy x3. He's coming over x4. And so now let's build our matrix. Let's see if we can. Probably going to have to build it over here. Okay. So we want to build it for crossings one, two, three, and four. So we're going to have data for crossings one, two, three, and four. And we're going to have data corresponding to the arcs x1, x2, x3, x4. And let's go ahead and use our rule. So on the first crossing, what's on top? So x4 gets a t minus one, 1 minus t. So at x4, we get a 1 minus t. Now, what kind of crossing is this, the left or right? Well, let's see, if I put my right hand, my right thumb, it agrees, right-handed. So the tail, the guy going into it, is going to get a minus 1. And so x1 gets a minus 1. And the guy coming out, the 4, uh, oh, no, no, the, the 2 coming out gets a t. And we have zeros everywhere else. Okay, how many of the next one? The second crossing, x2 is on top. So we have for x2, 1 minus t. Uh, that's right, it's right-handed. So we get a minus 1 to x3, and we give a t to x4. And for number 3, what kind of uh, crossing is it? Oh, now it disagrees with my right hand. I have to use left-handed degrees. So it's a left-handed crossing, and so we still have a 1 minus t on top at x3. But on bottom, the tail's going to get a T now. The X4 gets a T. And the guy coming out, the undercrossing coming out, gets a, a minus 1. And the last one, crossing 4, left-handed, very good. So it has 1 minus T. And coming in is a T, because it's left-handed. And then you get a minus 1 for x3. OK. Well, fortunately, we don't have calculate the determinant of this. What do we get to do first? Yeah, I don't have a preference. I'm just going to do the last one. If you did like the first one, that's fine. OK, and how do we calculate the determinant of this remaining 3 by 3? So we're doing the determinant of this. What does that come out to be? How do you do it? Minus one minus t squared. Yeah, you pick a row or column to expand along, and then you multiply by the minors, right? The signed minors. So it's minus one times this minor, which is one minus t squared, uh, minus zero. Uh, minus, for the second one, it's then minus this entry times the minor you get from crossing out the row and column, which is 0 minus 1. So that's just, well, I'll put 0 minus 1. And then the last one's going to be a 0, plus 0 times something, which is 0. So we end up with, okay, negative 1 minus t squared 
is 1 squared minus 2t plus t squared uh, plus t. And so we end up with minus t squared plus 2t plus t plus 3t minus 1. And this is what we call the Alexander polynomial. So here's my notation, the Alexander polynomial. Here, I'm going to call this, this is what we call delta for Alexander, delta of the knot K, which for us was the figure eight knot. This is the knot, this is the knot five one, the figure eight knot. So delta of five one with the variable t. So we just calculated our first Alexander polynomial. It's kind of a, a special day. Yeah. Okay, so, so let's come look at this. We could do more. We can calculate for a lot more things. Uh, maybe we should just do one more example really quick. Let's do it for a really, uh, let's not just do knots. Let's do it for a link. So a link is just multiple knots linked together. The, the simplest link of more than one component is the hop link. See, there's just one guy inside the other. And so we can play the game with this one. So how would we do it? Well, we need to give it some orientation. So you orient the components however you want. And then how many arcs do we have? Yeah, only two. So we'll call this like maybe strand x1 and x2. And here are my two crossings. I call the one in front crossing one and the one in back crossing two. And so we get some matrix, we get two by two matrix. At crossing one, on top we have x2. So x2 is gonna get a one minus t. And what do we have on bottom? x1 and x1 again. So x1 is going to get a minus 1, it's also going to get a t. It's going to get the t on one of its uh, components and the minus 1 on the other one. It's going to get both of them, so it gets t minus 1. This other crossing has x1 on top, so that's where you get your 1 minus t. And then both the crossings on the bottom are, are x2, so it gets both the t and the minus 1. And now you delete any row or column you want. So I don't know. And it comes out to be t minus one. So this is the this is the Alexander polynomial for this link. I'll just call it L with value t L. Okay. But doing this, maybe you notice something. What what do you notice? For the determinant, no matter what diagram we picked, no matter what row or column you picked, you can show you comes out to be the same value. Is that true here? No. Yeah, if you had deleted like this first row or like second column, you can get one minus t out. And so you're like, wait a second. Isn't that just the inverse sine of the two minus The inverse sine. You don't mean sine inverse. You mean not trig functions. You're saying that the, just the sign's been flipped, the negative. Yes. That's right. So here, uh, it's up to a negative. Here, you're like, okay, you know, maybe try different diagrams. You can do the same thing as before. You can check the three Reitermeister moves and what they do to your uh, matrix and what the choice of row and column does. And you'll see that the Alexander polynomial is invariant. up to plus or minus some multiple of t to some power. So you know, you might end up instead of getting t minus t squared plus three t minus one, and if you did it some other way from some other diagram, you may end up with positive t cubed minus three t squared plus t. You could have gotten that instead because the difference between these two is just a multiple of negative t. You tracking with me? So, 
what we're going to do now is when I think about polynomials, I'm always going to think of them up to some multiple of plus or minus t to some power. But notice, like, like these guys are honestly different. Like t minus 1 is a very different creature than, you know, this, this, this guy which has three terms. So, like, you can be certain the half link is not secretly a figure 8 knot, which hopefully you knew already because the figure 8 knot has only one component, and the half link has two, and so there's no way to, you know, they're very different creatures. Okay. So, so it's invariant up to plus or minus t to the m. Um, I guess the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say is um, usually we think of these polynomials as just being some integral coefficient times some power of a positive power. But like, why not let yourself multiply by negative t's as well, right? Um, you know, there's, there's almost a nice symmetry to this where it's like, you know, you could, you could rewrite this as, as then minus 3 may only be a constant. And then so what do you multiply 3 to make you minus 3 the constant? Yeah, t to the negative 2. So then you have plus t to the minus 1 and t to the 1, and, which is t. Which is like, there's a nice symmetry about that. And so we're going to um, allow our t's to have negative exponents too. These are going to be, so we're going to say that uh, the, the, this uh, polynomial is a Laurent polynomial. That is... A polynomial has integer coefficients with powers of t, but also t to the minus 1. So it can also have uh, uh, negative uh, powers. So this is called a Laurent polynomial. Polynomial. <clears throat> cool. Okay, any questions on how we calculate these things? Well, let me show you uh, uh, this book. So, I mentioned before we have these, these knot tables. Well, these knot tables have in them, it gives you the Alexander polynomials. Or at least it gives you the coefficients of the Alexander polynomials, since you, know, you can always multiply by some power of t to move it around however you want. So the only information you need or the coefficients. And so let me give you, uh, I'll just tell you another one. I'll read it off from here. We'll get some more data and see if we notice any cool patterns. Um, here's, here's a cool looking one. This is the knot 5, 2. And so the knot 5, 2, here's I have some space I could draw it. He looks something like, hmm. Oh, that's not what I want. I want, I want him to, to go under. Yes, that's right. And then over. There we go. Bonus points if you learn to draw knots really well. Okay, so this is the knot 5, 2. And his Alexander polynomial comes out to be the Alexander polynomial of the knot 5, 2 in the variable t comes out to be 2t squared minus 3t plus 2, which you can always multiply through by, you know, plus or minus 1 or any power of t. So you can try and make it look a little more symmetric. And you get 2t minus 3 plus 2t to the minus 1. Okay, so these are, these are the same things. These are equivalent to each other. But I want you to notice something. These, these polynomials have some nice properties. Uh, let's hold on to that one. Here's the first property I want you to notice. How does this polynomial relate to the determinant that we were discussing earlier? Invariant. It's an invariant, yes. Well, come back over here. For this uh, polynomial, this was our code to build it, right? For the determinant, what was our code to, to build it? Well, the guy on top was, and the guys on bottom got, how, how, do you see any relationship between these? What's the relationship? Very good. So we've just shown, I mean, it follows immediately from the definition, 
But the determinant of a not k is just the value of the Alexander polynomial at negative 1. And so this is a really powerful thing because it encodes in all the information of the determinant. But that's just a one value for it, right? And so you might start wondering, huh, are there other special properties of this polynomial, right? Okay, one more thing to note. Um, we talked about determinant. We said p divides the determinant if and only if your polynomial is p colorable, right? And then in your assignment last time, you showed no not is what kind of colorable? Two. You can never be too colorable. So that means the two is never going to divide this. So what does that mean? Yeah, it's, it can't be even. Your determinant must be an odd number. And so like, you can check that really fast. You know, plug minus one into here, and it's like, what do you get? You get negative two, minus three, negative five, minus two, negative seven, which, oh, well, okay, up to absolute value seven, right? So, so you get a, a seven here, which is odd, and you know, they're always gonna come out to be odd. So if you sum up your, your coefficients up to sine, the appropriate sine, then it's gonna come out to be odd. Okay, very good. Uh, any other properties we can think of that hold true for this, uh, this polynomial? Well, I'll tell you one, but your job is to try and convince yourself of why it's true. We said that if you plug in negative one, you get out the determinant. What if you plug in positive one? Well, we can try a few examples. What, what happens in in, in this example, if you plug in positive 1, you, well, no, 4 minus 3 is, is 1. You get, you get 1. Plug, plug in positive 1 to this one. Oh, hmm. That's a link. Let's not worry about links. Plug in positive 1 into this not. What do you get? 3 minus 1 minus 1. 1. We keep getting 1. You can show you. That is it always comes out to be plus or minus one. And once we show a few more properties of it, this will be pretty, pretty quick to show. So for negative one, you got the determinant, but for positive one, it always comes out to be plus or minus one. The, oh, there's one last thing I have to convince you of, and this is, this is fantastic. Let's say you take a knot. Oh, let's go over here, we need more space. Take some knot. This is actually going to show us one of the weaknesses of the invariant. It's a nice one, but here's the weakness of it. Take some knot and when you're brushing your teeth in the mirror in the morning, hold up the knot to the mirror, right? You hold up your knot because, you know, what else would you do when you're brushing your teeth? And, and so what happens? So if your knot was a trefoil that looks like this, and you hold it up in the mirror. What do you get out? Well, everything's going to be flipped, and so it's going to look like... Okay. How do we do this? I think he looks like this, and he goes like this. Success? So if this is some not... In general, this is a K... And, you know, if there's some k, we'll call this the mirror image of k. I'll call it k hat, or k bar, to mean the mirror of k. Okay. The question I have is, how does mirroring impact the Alexander polynomial? So, so let's think. Well, what happens to any crossing? If I have some crossing... Well, I give it some orientation. And we said it doesn't matter which orientation you give it because if it's left-handed or right-handed, it's going to you know, be the same regardless of which orientation you give it. But you know, may maybe the orientation comes out to look something like this. I, I could equivalently give it the opposite. You know, this is the same as giving it the opposite orientation. But just as long as I give it some, some orientation. Now, when I give it this orientation, this guy on top gets a what? 1 minus t, that, uh, this is a 
left-handed, and, and this one is also left-handed, so this is left-handed, so this tail gets a T, right? Yeah, and the guy coming out gets a negative one. Now what happens when we mirror? The question is, are, are all the arcs gonna be labeled the same? Because if they're all labeled the same, the matrix ends up being the same, right? So let's see what happens when we mirror. We mirror this. It's like, okay, so he, oh, no, we were supposed to, yeah, mirror. So he's going like this. These are going like this. Now what kind of, what handedness is it? That's right, before it was left. But notice the mirroring process made it right. Oh, that might mess things up. So, so we look at this and we go, okay, so this guy on top is now labeled one minus T. And this guy, this tail is labeled, oh, since it's right, it's now minus one and T. And so notice these two guys switched places. And that's gonna change our matrix. And so that could potentially change a determinant. But, notice what happens if you switch orientation. This also will change the matrix, but change in orientation will keep the Alexander polynomial the same. So the Alexander polynomial of this guy, of k hat, will be the same. It's still the Alexander polynomial of k hat. And our question is, how does it relate over here to the Alexander polynomial of K? Okay, so no, notice what happens when we switch orientation. Everything looks the same, but the orientation is going to go backwards. So it's still right-handed. But notice how we label things now. The guy on top is one minus T. This part becomes T, and this part's minus one. And now all of the arcs are labeled the same as they were before they were mirrored. This was, oh, oh, it's right-handed. It's right-handed. So this is minus one, and this is t. It's right-handed. And now all of the arcs are labeled exactly as they were before they were mirrored. And so the matrix will be the same. And so this Alexander polynomial, the Alexander polynomial for k hat, or k bar, the mirror of k, is the same as the Alexander polynomial for k. So Alexander polynomial, is preserved under mirror image. So when you hold your, your knot up into the mirror and then you calculate the polynomial from the mirror image, it's the same thing as if you calculated it for your knot. And that's actually a really, really bad thing. Right, like well, why is this unfortunate? Not bad, but why is this kind of sad? Yeah, we can't distinguish knots from the mirrors. We would like an invariant that tells us that this knot and its mirror are not equivalent. Like, these two trefers are not equivalent. But as far as the Alexander polynomial is concerned, they look the same. And so it turns out it's actually a pretty hard problem to distinguish between knots and their mirrors. Okay, so I think that's um, one thing I wanted to say. I'm wondering if there's anything else I wanted to say about these. Oh! Oh, the last thing I want to say about them. Come back over here. Here, we need colors. Come, come, come back. So, here we set out one. It comes out to be plus or minus one. That's an important property. And, and notice, it also has this symmetry to it. Like the coefficients here are negative one, three, negative one. You know, it's like negative one, three, negative one. Or, or the coefficients here are like two, negative three, two. What, what's another way of saying that symmetry? Well, it's saying, so here's the claim. Here's the proposition. We're saying that the Alexander polynomial if you plug in t, should look the same as if you plug in t inverse. It looks symmetrical both ways. Example, for the figure eight knot, we have that 
the Alexander polynomial of the figure eight knot is, read it off to me, what is it? Yeah, minus t squared plus minus one. And notice what happens when you plug in t inverse. Well, you get minus t to the minus two plus three t to the minus one, minus one. Ah, oh, minus one, fit in there. Minus one. And you're like, well, that's a different kind of creature than that. Except we said we only consider these guys up to multiples of powers of t. And so this is equivalent to multiply through by t squared minus one plus three t minus t squared. I just multiplied the whole thing by a t squared. And now I get that they're the same. So, so they're the same up to, you know, whenever you see, when we talk about these polynomials, we always mean up to some plus or minus t to the some power. Yeah. Very nice. So, so why is that true? Let's prove it. Easy. Begin with some, some crossing, you know? Like, you, you just use that crossing rule. You just begin with some crossing. And it's like, you know, whatever. Whatever your orientation is. We could do it for left-handed or right-handed. Let me do a right-handed one because I like those better. So on top, we have one minus t coming out from the tail. It's right-handed, so it's a uh, minus one. Yeah, and a t. And now let's let's change it. Let's do the switcheroo where we're going to replace our t with t inverse. And let's see what we get. Well, we're going to get uh, this guy becomes one minus t inverse. Your minus one becomes, well, it's still minus one, and your t becomes t inverse. Lame, that looks very different than this. Our matrix looks very different. How could it possibly be the same? Because we consider these guys up to multiples. So what should we multiply by? What should we multiply by? Mm, almost. If I multiply by not t squared, like I want this to correspond, what should I multiply? Negative t. I'm going to multiply just by negative t. Just, just watch, you'll see it work. We multiply by negative t, so this is still like this. We multiply by negative t. And we get now, this guy on top is, this times negative t is negative t plus one, which is still one minus t. This guy becomes t, negative one times t, and this guy becomes negative one. Oh no, it looks like it's different than this, but then you do a little switcheroo, where you switch the orientations. So you switch, orientations, and then this just becomes what he looks like, this, this, and this, and now it's switched from being right-handed to being, well, it's still right-handed, except now the tail going into this right-handed guy is gonna be labeled t. So t minus one, one minus t, which is the same labeling it had before. So you switch t of t inverse, and then up to doing things they're allowed to do, multiplying by a power of plus or minus t to some power, in particular multiplying by t negative t, and switching orientation, you get the exact same matrix as you would have before. And so it has the same Alexander polynomial. And so this right here is our little, our little proof that you have this nice symmetry property. So these two properties together are very important. A Laurent polynomial. What should I say? Represents. I'll say represents a uh, the Alexander polynomial. P 
polynomial of some not. So we'll say like, let's say like a Laurent polynomial like f of t represents some Laurent polynomial. Let's say you have some polynomial and let's say you know it represents the Alexander polynomial of some not. Well, that implies we saw two things. One, that that polynomial of minus one comes out to be plus or minus one. And two, that that polynomial of t is f of minus t, where we, oh, not minus t, t to the minus one, where we understand that this is all up to multiples of plus or minus t to the m. Right, that's what we talked about. What am I about to say? That's what we saw, but it turns out it goes both ways. Any Laurent polynomial that has these two properties represents the Alexander polynomial of some knot. And so you can take any, you know, you go ahead and you're like, let me pick something that's symmetric and adds up to the right thing. And so you might be like, oh, I don't know. Let's say like f of t is like 5t squared. So over here I need like a 5t to the minus 2. And then, well, let's just say I want some constant term in the middle. So what does my constant term need to be? Well, I guess it needs to be like a, like a minus 9. It's like, OK, that, that a plus. It's, it's symmetric, and it satisfies this property. And so there's some knot out there that has this as its Alexander polynomial. Pretty cool. Okay, uh, we could stop there, but there's one last thing I want to show you. If you indulge me for about 10 more minutes. You down? Yeah. This is really cool. So Alexander introduced this polynomial like, what, like the, 18, no, the 1930s or something? Around the same time as Reidemeister. But then Conway comes on the scene. And you know he's jealous because Alexander has a polynomial, so he wants a polynomial too. And so Conway introduces his own polynomial that I want to introduce you to right now. Here's the Conway polynomial. So let's do it uh, for the figure eight knot once more. So we have a. Uh, Okay, this one's gonna get a little bit fun, but here we go. So we have our figure eight knot. And here's Conway's rule. He says, forget about matrices, forget about you know, these complicated labeling processes. He introduces something called a skein relation. So what is a skein relation? A skein relation it's, it's, a, it's a recursive, essentially it's a recursive way to calculate these. It's, it has three properties. Property one, he says, I'll call the Conway, here, I'll use an, an, an upside down uh, triangle, this is called NABLA, for the Conway. I'll call it the Conway uh, polynomial for some unknot. I'll let that be one. So that's my, my first property. Property two. The Conway polynomial we use for links. And so if you have some trivial link, more than just one component, with multiple components, some trivial link, you know, here he has a couple different components, that comes out to be zero. Likewise, if you had three or four components, as many components as you want. And finally, he then introduces a skein relation where he says the Conway polynomial for L plus is the Conway polynomial for L minus, minus Z times the Conway polynomial for L zero, where L plus is some right-handed crossing, L minus is the corresponding left-handed crossing. So I guess we can make it left-handed by switching this around. And L0 
is the guy you get by smoothing out this crossing or resolving this crossing. So you say, well, him, instead of crossing over, I'm going to smooth it out. And so you get something that looks like this. So he says, whenever you have a crossing, there's three things you could do, right-handed, left-handed, or smooth it out. And I'm going to relate these by the Conway polynomial for, for it being right-handed, L plus, equals the Conway polynomial for when it's left-handed, minus z times when it is smoothed out. And this is a polynomial in z. And so let me show you how you do this. You take some knot. Let's see how we use this. And you give it some orientation, like usual. Doesn't matter what you do. Because either way you go, it'll give you the same handedness. And then you pick some crossing. Like, let's zoom in on this one. Now, what kind of crossing is that? That's a, that's a right-handed one, that's right. So this is our L0. And then we say, but what would happen if we were to transform that into, no, that's not an L, that's an L plus. <laughs> What would happen if we made that an L minus? Well, I'll tell you what happened if you made that an L minus. Let's see. So this cross scene would be switched. And so now this one would be on top like this, right? And so then he would come down still. And this would go over. And he's going to come over here. And then he comes like this. Something like this, right? Here I just changed that crossing. Changed everything else I kept the same, but just in this circle I made the change. Kept the orientation the same, everything else I kept the same. And similarly, you can consider, what if I change that L plus to an L zero? How would it look? And you're like, well, I have to smooth it out. And so this would be, well, how would this be smoothed out actually? Let's, let's think. This guy coming in, would be smoothed out so it goes out there. And this guy coming in would be smoothed out like this. So he'd end up looking like like this, right? Smoothed it out some. Still keep the same orientations. Orientations aren't really that important. You just need to have them. OK. This knot up here, the L minus, what is it? Not. Yeah, that's the same as the other. You can pull this guy on top, you can untwist it. So this is secretly just the unknot. And so we know the value of this guy, uh, Conway polynomial for this L minus, um, comes out to be, it's of the unknot. So it comes out to be 1. How about down here, what do we have? Well, he is a half link. You just smooth him out and you just have some link like this, right? Okay, so what, is, what does he look like? So we can calculate him and him and him. And he comes out to be, well, I don't know. I haven't gotten down to one of these two ending points yet. So what do you think we should do now? The same trick again. Zoom in on some crossing. I'll just pick one at random. This one. What kind of crossing is that? It's a left-handed, so that's an L minus. And now we can resolve this. It's called a resolution tree. One way we can consider what happens if we make it L plus, and the other way we consider what happens if we make it L naught. If you make it L plus, now he's going to go on top. And so you have him all the way on top. And then he looks like this. Right? And if you smooth it out the other way, so this is like this guy coming in, comes out here, comes out here. And so he ends up looking like, like this. Give it some orientation if you like. OK, this guy on the left, what's the Conway polynomial for uh, this guy? You know what? I'm not going to call these L because I can get confused with these Ls. I'll call it just M. 
let's call it M. It's a different cost. You can go L prime or something if you want. So, so what do we have here? We have the Conway polynomial for M plus is zero because it's a two component trivial link. And here, this is the same as the a naught. So the Conway polynomial for M naught comes out to be one. So what does that tell you about um, the Conway polynomial for M minus, which is this guy, uh, which is th this guy right here? What's the poly uh, Conway polynomial for M minus come out to be? Well, for L minus, it's just L plus plus Z times L naught. So this is just gonna be whatever the polynomial was for M plus plus Z times whatever it was for M naught. So that just comes out to be zero plus Z times one. So it's Z. So this one, our L naught is Z. This is the same as this. So, so the common polynomial for L naught is Z. And then we go back to the top step, L plus, the Conway polynomial for L plus is just going to be whatever it was for L minus, minus Z times whatever it was for L naught. And so that gives you one minus Z times Z, one minus Z squared. And so you get the Conway polynomial for the figure eight naught, Conway polynomial for the figure eight naught, not five one, comes out to just be one minus z squared. And you can do that for any crossing? For any knot you want. Okay. Now. Well, you pick like a specific crossing on them. Yeah, you pick any crossing you want and you resolve it. Okay. Yeah. And you get some polynomial in terms of z. Now, you might be saying, what's the big deal? <laughs> I'll tell you. Because the Conway polynomial isn't actually different than the Alexander polynomial. You say, what? I thought that the Alexander polynomial came out to be, you know, this, this minus t squared plus 3t minus 1. That looks nothing like this. That's right. These are z's and those are t's. There was a conversion. The, the Alexander polynomial for a naught, t, is just the Conway polynomial, but instead of plugging in z to it, you instead plug in t to the half minus t to the negative half. It's like, that's a weird conversion, but let's check it. What is it for the figure eight knot? The Alexander polynomial for the figure eight knot, so this is the knot five, one, should come out to be what you get when you plug in t to the half minus t to the minus half squared, right? What do we get? Well, we get one minus this guy squared is t, minus two times this, two times one is two, minus plus him squared is uh, t to the minus one. So he comes out to be <coughs> one plus two, which is three. We have a minus t, and you have a minus t to the minus one, which is exactly what we have over there. Up to, you know, whenever we say this, we always mean up to some multiple of plus or minus t to the m. Well, now you have half power, so it's really m over two. Maybe you need multiply by some half power to clean things up. Mm. So here, the skein relation is a very different combinatorial kind of way of calculating the same thing we did before, the Alexander polynomial. And perhaps as we move along in this course, we see one or two other ways to calculate the Alexander polynomial that look very differently, but all come out to be the same. Okay, we'll stop there for today.